as she has pointed out, San Lucas is unique in using that word in its true sense of the term. It is different from others. And it's different uh, primarily in two different ways. First of all, everything that we do there, all the programs, all the efforts, are based on, indeed, expressed self do Now that's the way people who work with the poor of the world or work in different areas will often say that is the what we do, we do in the express cell need, but the reality is different. They'll come in and <clears throat> maybe make some kind of inquiry, go on from there, but basically, especially if you're dealing with the people who suffer the process of poverty, if you go in with a bunch of questions and say, uh, well, what do you need, what would you like? They're always looking to say, we want to answer them the way they want to be answered, so they will do it. That's the first thought in the people's mind. And so you're not going to get a, a, an honest answer from them because they don't think that's what you want. However, our coming to San Lucas was distinct. We were not prepared. No one of us working there is what you might call a professional missionary. We are uh, basically diocesan, diocesan priests. And the sisters, the school sisters of Notre Dame. And uh, our whole work and terrorism and preparation was distinct and different. We got involved in, in uh, working with the, uh, with the situation in Guatemala in the early 60s when the bishops of Latin America were beginning to form dioceses. They had for a church the magnificent Spanish colonial churches built in the, the late 1500s, early 1600s. They are lots of people, but they have no personnel. So they're asking people up here in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, could you help us out? And at that time, the, the diocesan priests were by, by the bushel. Now they're an endangered species, and you know so very well. But at, at that time, there were a bunch of them. So they set the office. And now they have a little old uh, Alpha Schladwell, a very pastoral person. He said, yeah, we're going to help out. So, the notion of mission back in those times was proselytization. You went on, you made Christians out of people, especially the pagans. And, and so we didn't know any better, so we were going to say, what, what do you do? Well, it became worse for us. Because, uh, well, I didn't want to go. I was teaching out in western Minnesota, working in high school, and, and the parish said, loved it. I'd just been ordained and so glad to get out of the seminar. I didn't want to move and was afraid I'd have to go back. And so I... <laughs> <laughs> and then when I... They couldn't find anybody else to sit down. And, you know, what a, wonder, what a wonderful way to be chosen. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went. But the deal was for five years, and then I could come back and do what I wanted to do anyway. Well, I was supposed to follow another priest around. When I got there, he was in obligations with the, the Minnesota Air National Guard. He had to come back because his division was going to be going over to Vietnam. He had to go with him. Yeah. So I ended up the only foreigner there for a year. No Spanish, no understanding of culture, didn't even know I was crossing the culture, let us understood it. And there I was. So I was completely and totally dependent upon the people. They could have thrown me out in a minute, and I wouldn't even know I bounced. <laughs> and yet, they were so good to me. Now, there are a bunch that didn't want me around. That's normal. Mm -hmm. Any kind of a situation. Got a strange guy coming in, what's going to happen, you know? He might contaminate us, and so we've got to be careful. However, for the most part, by far, they were very patient, they were very understanding, very open to take it. And more important still, they were willing to teach. And they're very patient, very kind, and very understanding in their teaching. And I'll forever, ever be indebted to those people for that. And, and I really feel that debt. I want to live it the best I can. And so that has been the struggle. Now with that kind of a beginning, with that kind of a situation, and becoming completely dependent upon the people, 
and knowing they would have to tell us what to do and how to do it. And when you stop and think about it, well, that makes sense. They're the ones suffering the process of poverty. They're the ones whose culture has been kept from happening. That's what oppression is all about. They know how to get out of it is given the chance. I didn't think of it in that way until years later, but that was the reality. And so I kept saying, hey, tell us what to do. Tell us, please. And so slowly but surely they started in. And in that process, we would build our programs. They would help us. They would guide us. We would make our mistakes together. We would stumble onwards. And, and slowly but surely, you know. And over a period of time, it was, it was amazing. Uh, and it, it started to show up that the programs that they were uh, directing us to do were guiding us to the areas of five specific happenings in the lives of people. First of all, they, helped, they insisted, help us buy land so we can grow our own food. Now those, those, that, those messages were made known to me. And they've kind of come out in stories now. I'm writing about these in a, a series of newsletters that I've been able to keep up pretty well since last September, and I will continue. And so people will have an idea about this, and I would hope sometimes some people working in mission will at least take this into consideration of way of going about it. Dependence on the people, they'll tell you, respond to them. Express felt need in the past of terminology. But that's the struggle. The way you find out about these things, we're helping people with a food program, well, stuff from the U.S. government, wonderful, good, heavy, rich gruel, bread. Uh, we were told that, uh, uh, Padre, uh, thanks for your food, but don't give us your food. Help us buy land so we can produce our own food. I should have known that. For goodness sakes, that's, uh, that's a scenic one done for a culture. They have to have their own food. We don't have to. Uh, when you go out to meal, and what do you say? Well, what are we going to do today? We're going to do some, some Italian? There's a new place down the street. <laughs> we're going out on West 7th and we'll hit the Glockenspiel. It's the greatest German food in the country. You know, that kind of thing. But it never dawned on me. That profile came out from the La Viva University and five University of Guatemala City then. That the Guatemalan, for the Guatemalan belief that tortillas raised on land of their own by the very people, are more nutritious and better tasting. And any Mayan woman will tell you, Abunda Mas, you're going to get more tortillas for power. And you can say all you want that there's not going to stand up to a scientific test. That's right. But there ain't no scientific test that will stand up to a Mayan belief. Not even close. <laughs> so that need to help people get land. And that's brought home to us. And we've been struggling with that over the years. And we'll continue. We'll continue. And secondly, the shelter. People were living in corn stack huts, uh, grass roofs, uh, three rocks in the center of the drift floor, and that's the, the cooking stove, and ah, the smoke, you know, just terrible. And I ran into having to bring the sacraments of sick to some grand old fellow dying there as an aged person. It hit me at that time. This fellow was born into this stuff, lived his infancy in this stuff, his childhood, his adolescence, fell in love with the gale of his dreams in this stuff, eventually married, raised their family in this stuff, lived his old age in this stuff, and now died. This is the dignity of a human being. This cannot be, for goodness sakes. We have to do something about that. That's where the whole sense of building houses. And then the complexity that came with the houses, you know, having to build a sewer system, have to bring electricity, have to bring in quality of water, getting the right kind of materials to keep it within a range, size, all of those things develop slowly but surely. At first, we didn't have people that could build the houses. We had to train them. I didn't train them. They had to learn themselves. How do you learn? What are you doing? Well, what happens if it's, uh, if it's not straight? Knock it down, don't tell anybody, it's not over. <laughs> Literally, the way you go about it. And that's, what, that's been a very much a part of us. 
that effort. But, but houses, not simple ones based on what the people can afford, but good ones based on what the people have a right to live because they're made to the image and likeness of Creator God. <coughs> and then thirdly, health care. When we started with the community, we didn't have any health person when we first came. And, uh, and then Don Tino uh, Procopio well, had, could give injections, and so he was kind of it, but that was it. Well, now there's a 47 bed hospital, a clinic, a local doctor, and local staff. In fact, at this time, as Chona was mentioning, doctors come in as a group of surgeons from Michigan, taking care of general surgery for people for a week. Over a period of one week, they'll do anywhere between 94 and 104 procedures. Our clinic staff will prepare the people, have them ready for the surgery, take care of the post care using vehicles available to go and get people and bring them home and, and it's you know it's a marvelous marvelous opportunity and the people pay what they can that's it so you get the cooperation from those doctors the cooperation with the medical people there and then the the people are able to celebrate that in their own lives all this by a slow gradual telling us telling us what we need telling us what we need We'll do our part, you do your part. The same thing in education. There's one school with about 80 kids. Now we have an elementary school. We stuck with elementary. And the reason is because in Guatemala, our educational system is so poor. It's the worst on the continent, the second worst, worst in the hemisphere. So, I gotta, you know, if you don't get good, solid education at the primary level, the rest of it's not going to work. And so that's what we focus on. All now local teachers, even a Montessori school for four-year-olds, and, and the 600 kids in the elementary school, free school through sixth grade. We'll give some scholarships for continuing education, but that's always not so good because the educational level is poor. But that elementary school is really a, a fine quality. The teachers are been with us for many years. Uh, that we, we make available to them everything they need to be good teachers. And all we ask from them is use the skills that God has given you and you have developed to see to it that these kids have what they deserve. As being made to the image and likeness of God, Creator God. You've got a role to play here. Play it, play it well. Pretty tough. Pay teachers get a lot of benefits, but we're also very demanding. And they're responding well, responding well. And then, fourth or fifthly, jobs. We help create jobs. Primarily for us is to develop the different skills, the skills in the building, the uh, stone masonry, rock cutting. We're in an area of the world where it's all volcanic rock. We have to cut it all by hand and move it out, use it in different ways. And then there's um, plumbing, electricity, uh, carpentry, welding, all of these different types of skills that people have to have an opportunity to develop on the job while learning a small salary. Now there are people in charge, the master masons, etc., are in charge of the group that come on. And in so doing, they, their, their salaries increase as their skills develop. And then we don't want them to hang around with us all forever. Start up your own little thing going, develop your own contracts, or get on to bigger and more powerful organizations where you can, your skills can be used better. But use this space, go forward. And we're, we're very pleased with the way that's developed. In fact, we have trouble, you know, with how with kids, you get into trouble with gangs and drugs and, and, and alcohol abuse. I remember one morning at a coordinated session we'd have every day. I was complaining, waxing eloquently and condemning these kids to hell and gone with like they deserved for what they were doing and all of this, this, and this. And the guys at the session said, hey, Father, why don't you quit complaining and do something about it? I said, thanks a lot, guys. You know, what are you going to do with a bunch like this? Well, give them a job. What do you mean, give them a job? These guys can't pick up one foot and put it down in front of the other one without getting into trouble. How are you going to give them a job? 
No, I gave him a job. And well, and so the different uh, crew chief said, well, we'll take care of the teacher. And the, the uh, fellow who happened to be the director of the construction office loved working with kids. He had two sons of his own. And so he said, I'll kind of look over him. He said, all right, give it a try. <coughs> so they went amongst, amongst these gang kids. And they put it to him, you know, all, all with this uh, uh, gentle psychological approach and all. Hey, look, guys, you're making fools of yourselves and of the community. We're going to give you a job. You stay, you stick with this job, you do some learning, you stay clean for a year, we'll give you a scholarship to any school you want. But you stay clean for a year. And you follow the rules. So again then, they started, the 50 kids said, yeah, we'll try. And so <coughs> they really got some understanding and appreciation for their value as, as struggling workers, etc. And when they got down to the, the job on Monday morning, they were given a two, hung, two and a half pound hammer and a big stone. And they said, make little ones. <laughs> huh? yeah. Literally, they had to make you grab them. Well, for the construction people, that was 200 quetzales a cubic yard less than when we had to buy it. So that's what they were interested in, to get a bunch of guys to make gravel. And so, and so and these kids stuck with it. I couldn't believe it, you know. And then after they got, they kind of got more confidence, they said, hey, how about helping us learn how to build a house? I was down there one time amongst them, you know, and I said, well, you can't build a house, I mean, you can hardly make gravel. <laughs> <laughs> well, give us a chance and we'll show you how. Well, by golly, I was, I was amazed. I was amazed. I had no idea. One of the delightful things, one of those kids wanted to become an airplane mechanic. How are you going to become an airplane mechanic? Well, you had, the only airplane you ever saw in your life was the one up, way up in the sky. Yeah, I want to be an airplane. All right. Well, to be an airplane mechanic in Guatemala City, you gotta, you got to belong to the to the Air Force Training Academy. You know, like, what do we have in Denver someplace? Mm -hmm. So here this guy has, and of course, uh, their uniforms, etc., etc., are based on Gilbert and Sullivan. <laughs> the, the, the old-fashioned kind, you know, with, with a hat and the thing under your nose, and you got a sword and all of this. And for a firm, forget get a weekend off and come home, he had to wear that gingerbread stuff. <laughs> well, can you imagine him coming amongst his buddies, wearing that stuff? Well, he did it. And he, you know, he took all of the guff and everything, but he got by the kids in America and they're kind of like, mechanic today. Now, not all of them made it, of course. Some blew it, and, and they, all right, and, and keep coming back the best you can. But these are the kinds of things coming from the people constantly. And it turns out that the five principal areas of effort that Chona was talking about on this program are the five areas we call human rights. <coughs> Food, shelter, health care, education, and jobs. And jobs, because work is the use of gifts from the Creator to work with the Creator in the continuation of creation. That's what that's all about. That's what being made to the image and likeness of God is all about. That's what we're here for. And unbeknown to us, the people told us, this is what we want you to get involved in to help us be that. And so that, I think that that is the thing that I'm so proud of and pleased of. Because I didn't design it. I didn't come up with it. I tried hard to respond to the people the best I could, and the people were generous and patient and kind enough to teach us how it was done. And so that effort. Now the coming of these people here, as they're doing, now last week they were down in the next Kansas, the suburb south and east of uh, Kansas City, to a parish there that had been helping our school for years. They put on a grateful dinner as they put on this lunch for us here today. And gratitude. And only there they served a formal festive Guatemalan meal called Tepian de Pollo. It's a huge special sauce, chicken, 
over a bed of rice, and then they had, of course, the guacamole, the free fried beans, the tortillas, and all that go with it. Well, yeah, that's a thousand miles. <coughs> they prepared that stuff up in Medina. Brought it down, served 1,250 people. I got a phone call two days ago uh, by the people who were in charge there, Waxy and Elephant. They had the work of those people. The object is not to get you people interested in eating tostados and chuchitos so we can sell corn. <laughs> the, the, the object is to, is to deal with a situation that is very difficult when you deal with people who suffer the process of poverty or for what we commonly call the poor of the world. There's a way of looking at the people who are living in what I want to call a process of poverty because it's an ongoing destructive process that makes people less and less of who they really are. But anyway, they, that was dealt with. That question, why are the, what is the first world, that is the golden age culture that we live, for instance, look upon the third world, or the people as they can use commonly the term the poor. But I want to say the people living in the process of poverty. Why are they poor? And the two liberation theologians, brothers from Brazil, last name Boff, UNLF, Leonardo and Clodovis. Of ten children, Leonardo was the oldest, Clodovis the youngest. Both liberation theologians. Wrote in a book, 1970. It's called Introducing Liberation Theology. And they, uh, they, they dealt with that question. Well, they said the first world looks at the third in three different ways. First of all, empirically. That is, empire, top down. The reason you're poor is you're dumb and lazy. How are you going to treat you? Well, charity. Here's your two bits, keep the pencil. You know, when you think of one of the principal logos from Mexico, the fellow leaning up against the cactus with a big sombrero over his head, and it's the land of manana, the land of siesta. Secondly, it's a function. The reason that you are, are poor is that you're not with it in the 20, 21st century. So you've got to make the quantum leap. And we'll help you do that by teaching you how. We'll show you how. We'll give you programs. That's what governments do. That's what the World Bank does. That's what the International Monetary Fund does. You don't ask the people, we'll tell you. I've always thought, how can that be? One culture telling another culture what to do? To be a, to be a culture? Apples can't tell oranges out of taste? No how. And we tried it. And we don't work. The third way the Boff Brothers cost is dialectical. That's the way you go to the people and you ask them, why are you poor? They'll tell you, well, we're oppressed. Well, what does that mean? We can't live our culture the way we'd like to for various and sundry reasons. But if you want to help us, give us a chance to live our culture. And then we'll take care of it from there. That's the role of church. That's the role of any of us who understand these people as equals, made to the image and likeness of God, just like the rest of us are. And reaching out in that way. And that is our struggle. And I think that's what makes San Lucas unique. We deal in all of those areas because the people have told us. We try and continue to grow with them as they grow. Oh, I, I want to bring these people, have these people come up and do these things. And it's, it's basically to show off their talents and their gifts. Once you can get to see people and, and taste their foods and, and the delight in their talents in cooking, it's a little different situation. You know, they really can't be all that dumb if they can make a chuchito. You know? <laughs> and so it's, uh, and that, that I think is important. You get that kind of a sense of the people. And they do a good job at it, as you can see. And so the struggle, and it's shown up and out so very well, you're the people with your kindness and ongoing support that makes it possible. We don't put together a 
a hard sell type of thing never will. I mentioned earlier I'm writing these newsletters that come out monthly and uh, keep up the best I can. And all of these over the next uh, year or so, I'll be showing how we go about this so that we can have a, a sense of, uh, of how we come to be where we are, how we will continue doing what we do, and the results of those efforts. Okay, are there any questions or thoughts or comments? Yes. Well, since you're here, who's over there? Pardon me? Since you're here, who's over oh, there? Oh, that, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and the one I should have touched on, I didn't. Excuse me, I want to sit down if I may. Even as you don't let me, I want to sit down. <laughs> the, uh, I've always been convinced that the people will be able to run the things if we can make available for them to do it. And so they continue to do it. I have regular contact with them by phone or suggestions. Mm -hmm. My job is to see that we can keep working on raising the funds so they can have what they need to do. It. Mm -hmm. They can do it themselves. I think just listening to Chona talk, she's quite, quite a competent lady, you know. Mm -hmm. She's going to make things happen, especially around the kitchen. All you have to do is get out of her way. <laughs> well, it might cost you a little bit, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's, that's the way. They'll, they'll do it. And I'm, I'm fairly convinced of that. And very proud of what they're doing. It's a year and a half now. Pretty close, anyway. And they're going onward, as she mentioned very clearly. Here they got a group of surgeons in down there now, doing these things going on. And old Uncle Greg isn't down there to hold anybody's hands. <laughs> They wouldn't then they can't stand blood. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but that's, that's the thing that I'm so encouraged about. I get a lot of criticism for that, as you can well imagine, you know. Well, you know, but, but they're, you know, they're, they're, how do they know? Well, they're limited. They know. Give them a chance to, to show how much they know. Well, you mentioned uh, that you aren't a hard, hard sell when it comes to fundraising. Well, I applaud you, but somehow without any hard selling, you're raising in the area of, someone is raising in the area of a million dollars a year annually mm -hmm. to run the programs and the mission. Right. Will you and your uh, letters that you're writing, your messages, um, explain how you accomplished, um, not that I want to replicate sure, that sure, for sure, my sure. own personal benefit, but... <laughs> <laughs> Basically what we attempt to do is make known to the people what's happening. Make known to anybody who will listen. And you respond the way you would like. That's the way we primarily go about fundraising. We don't come right out and ask. We'll present programs, we'll present special efforts being made, and just present them. And if you want to get involved, fine. If you don't, okay, that's up to you. It depends on what you can do and when you can do it. Well, you have to be addressing a lot of groups. Oh, oh yeah, I oh, yeah. We're all over the U.S., you know. Uh, mailing list of 8,000 people. You have a mailing system. Mm -hmm. Poor souls. <laughs> and then we, uh, but, that, and that's what we, and then as Chona mentioned, the group's coming in. Uh, that's, that's another area in which we're unique. We leave the door open to anybody who wants to be a volunteer or anybody who wants to come in and visit. And uh, when you have good volunteers like you, you met today, that works good. But you can get some lemons, too. Do <laughs> you get any money from them? Well, they, no, they don't get, they get nothing but a pain in the neck from those. <laughs> but yeah, I just it's one of the things that I've run into since I've been home is the, the gossip that can come. Mm -hmm. They've got a gal down there that's been, she's not a volunteer, she's just latched on and she's been around. And things didn't work out for her a while in the States, so she tried to down in Guatemala. You know why it didn't work out for her down in the States when the season was going about. She's going around telling people that the guy that runs our office 
that receives the money and sees to it that it's distributed properly stole 700000 to build this house. Well, geez, the poor guy couldn't write 700000 let alone try and steal it. And I know every single cent that goes in and every single cent that goes out. And there's a receipt on everything. Where it came from and where it went. And there's at the end of the calendar year, there's a report on that. That's <coughs> where it made it available down in the pastoral center. Anybody who wants it. It's a detailed situation. It's done a booklet form. It's not a nice, neat type of accounting we might familiar with. But I've always believed that accounting, basically what you got to do is where the money comes from, where it goes, and uh, what's it used for. And then you want to see some results from it. So the interest isn't in numbers. The interest is in what's happening and how it's going about. So that's what we attempt to do. And, and it's, uh, I think it's an ongoing process and it can continue to be. Now, obviously, after I'm dead and gone and whatever, well, somebody else will pick it up. I'm sure they will uh, do it better or not as good, whatever. But it just goes on. Well, your contacts are worth a million dollars a year. <laughs> yeah. So I hope you leave a, a lengthy and detailed message someplace with someone so that we can pick it up and hopefully make it two million or ruin it and come out with nothing. Is he taking that task on? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, but you know, there's an awful lot of people. We, we don't deal with uh, big foundations. You know, like uh, Uncle Warren hasn't responded to one of our questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, don't, we don't get in on those big hitters. But it's basically a lot of what if I may use this kind of terminology. A lot of ordinary, a lot of little people making a lot of effort. That's basically what's behind this. Father Greg, John back there is interested in the Women's Center. He wants to financially support it. Can you tell him a little bit about the Women's Center? <laughs> 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 and sign him up, right? Yeah. 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 He, he got really the card today. Yeah. What's the question, John? <laughs> no, actually, go ahead and answer Kathy's question because oh, okay. I think the Women's Center, Center is yeah. pretty interesting. That's kind of one of those things that's. Uh, I'd have to say it's a dream. And how did it work? These Mayan women have a, are, are powerful, powerful people. Mean as sin, tough as nails, but wonderful, wonderful people. And one of the things about them is they, their, their work in the home as wife, mother, and grandmother is, is just overwhelming. When you stop and think about it, these are the kinds of things you learn. The men work in the fields, and they bring in the products. They'll bring in the corn, they'll bring in the beans, and they'll bring in anything. And it's, and it's just the beans are brought in in the, in the husks and big nets. The corn is brought in on the cob. They have to prepare that into food. So they got to go through not just one, but three steps. They have to process first. They have to take the beans out of the hull. They have to, they have to whittle them. And they don't have fans, they got to do that in the wind. And the same thing with the corn. And then they have to pick them over to get the good ones. Now that process is done. Then they take it into the house and cook it. <coughs> then for the cooking, they prepare the meals. So there's, you know, there's just so much. They're also basically the medical people. And the women uh, in, in this culture, uh, they're, they're the... Now, we are a matriarchal culture, you know what? The, the story of creation tells us that the poor Father God created the world, but he couldn't create humankind. Yeah. He blew that, so he had to go to a loan that was Mother God. Yeah. And so Mother God said, I'll create humankind. And so she goes to Grandmother, God Ishmu Kane. And Ishmu Kane says, take corn from my grinding stone, make humankind. I love it when I get that rendition of the story. Yeah. So I said, oh, you guys got three gods. They said, no, you got one god. What do you mean? I said, you just gave me three names. Come on, Poppy, how can you have a father god without a mother god? 
Grandmother God with a mother and father God. Huh? Yeah, but three names. You tell me about the Blessed Trinity. Oh, yeah, right. We'll talk about that later, you know. But but that that's their mentality. And so it's a matriarchal society because woman is the source of life and sustainer of life through food. And our food is corn. That's what we're made of. Well, women then have all kinds of what they call secretos. And that's the, dealing with food, dealing with medicine, dealing with culture, dealing with tradition, dealing with wisdom, dealing with all of these things. And because of their work keeping them to the end of the home so much, they don't have much of an opportunity to share it. So I was like in the back of my mind, if we could have a place where they could come, but on their own conditions, don't organize stuff. Boy, if you ever want to blow those wonderful traditions, just organize them. You know. <laughs> and then they're gone. So just let them come and to at their own their own rate and come with their friends. They relate a lot better to friends and extended family than they do to any kind of a chosen group. That's just the way they function. I guess we all do anyway. And so leave the doors open. Let them come and they come when they want. To. And so that's what they do. Now we want to have a little bit of a core work. And one of the things is most of the fruit in San Lucas area is raised on trees. And so you end up with uh, a whole bunch of fruit with a short shelf life at, during the year. So you end up with a lot of, uh, of overripe fruit. And you know, during the Second World War, for any kind of a mother, overripe fruit meant sauces, jams, and jellies. And I grew up in such a family. And mother wouldn't throw anything away. You know? And so that's what happened. If it couldn't go into a sauce, jam, or jelly, it went into chutney. What is chutney? Don't ask. <laughs> and, and so what they, they give the women an opportunity to make that. And then they can, um, and, and they can use it with their families. But it's only for their families. Another good way to get rid of that and uh, override food is it what we call breakfast breads. You know, the bread's made out of, of uh, 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 soda, baking soda or baking powder. They're not too hard. But that's quite a treat for our people. And so mother can make it. There, she doesn't have much of a chance to bake because of the stove that she works with for the time she has. But the women's center, they have ovens, and Shona works with them and helps them. Uh, and kind of get the knack of that. They know how they're, they're women for them to say. Been feeding families for years. But just give it a chance to try it out. The only thing is, we don't want it to be made to be sold. It's not for that kind of income, it's for family. And so after you're gone much of the day and you come back to your old man who's mean, <coughs> it all comes up out of the, out of the mountains here, here. Have a slice of this. This is what your wife made for you. And then keep that in your mouth and the words that are going to go with it. And it's amazing how the women have responded. They have sewing machines there so they can sew if they wish. They have some old big bag <coughs> washing machines so they can wash their, their clothes while they're cooking or whatever they're doing. Uh, they're weavers. Most of the people are weavers and so they have some from other communities that have different designs if they'd like to learn them. Crochet and uh, embroider. And then they even have a, an area where they can learn to read and write the way they want to. Not in a formal class where they're going to be embarrassed and all that in competition. And, and they come and go on that. And it's been very, very well received. Uh, and it's just a real open-ended, easy-going. I mentioned Shona has really put it on the... She has groups of people that are working with her. And uh, surprisingly, surprisingly well. And then they're, they're talking all the time. You can well imagine you're sharing all these secrets. You know? <coughs> There's a big medicinal garden, plant, medicinal plant garden there. They've got a, a little vegetable garden about this big out and back, just to let people know how much you can, how much vegetables you can raise in a little, in a, in a little spot in your own backyard if you want. And so there's those different types of things, and I'm sure that there are more ideas will develop as this thing grows. So that, I've uh, been very pleased with that. Um, and, and 
what, what else was there? That was, are you in, John? Oh, well, are you ready? Yeah. yeah. That, was good, that was a good sell. Way to go, Kathy. <laughs> uh, no, I, had, I had a different question, actually. So, Chona was saying that, that it's unique. This area is unique. You have so many programs compared to other areas around Guatemala. I'm kind of curious, what's the posture, what's the feeling from the, the national government from about, there? about this area? The Guatemalan government, how do they feel about San Lucas and the things that are going on there today? <laughs> you know, we've been going on this, and we, 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 we're, a, we're a country that had 36 years of civil war. Right. started in 60, about the time we started, ended in 96. In 79 to 85, with the overt violence, they were shooting people in the streets. And, and so, there are a lot of questions asked. And I always felt the best way to deal with this would be open. So when a new military person came in to run the community, I'd go right to them, put it out on the line. Here's our schedule. You're welcome to come wherever we go. The doors of the house are always open. Uh, our books are always open. You're welcome to go in the office at any time and ask all the questions you want. For the most part, that worked out. There are a couple of guys that were a little bit, a little bit scary, but for the most part, they worked out pretty well. Now the government, it's interesting. You know, I, I, how, what do you really think? I think most of them think we're crazy, and so that's okay. <laughs> there, there are some that, uh, you know, we we we've helped four thousand families get land. You know, so we had to buy a lot of land to do that. And uh, there's some concern about we're going to buy up all of the land around there. Land is the, the greatest resource apart from the people. And they're afraid we were going to compete with the elite of the country. 94% of the land is in the hands of 7% of the people. 80% of the arable land is in the hands of 2%. Well, there are some that kind of thought we were going to get involved in that. Well, we couldn't compete with those guys. We just got land that was available to us to help divide it off the people. And, uh, and then I think that, if I could put it this way, about the best way to express that, that when uh, we received the, the Order of the Kinsab Award, that's the highest award that the Guatemala government can get. And, you know, it's got to put a name on it, so... But they gave that to the program. I was reaching out to so many people. And the group of people that were in uh, pushing this thing got a chance to talk directly with the president to be able to present it because it had to come through him and the Congress. And so they had, you know, all of the kind of stuff that was going on. And he simply said to them, you don't have to bring that to us. We know what's going on. And that's how it came. And it's a, it's a medal. We've got it in church down there. So everybody can see. This is, and the president came out to San Lucas to give it. And, and it, was, it wasn't for an individual. It was for all the people. All that, all, all that's going on. The effort. It sounds like there's a respect there. No. It was, yeah. And I, thought, I think that that's the thing. And as far as the government's concerned, that would be the best thing in the world. You know, you keep those people quiet, you know. They're not going to be picking up guns. They're too busy. It was interesting. We had a show that put on one of those great big Thanksgiving dinners, you know, just like we have them here with a turkey and everything. Dressing. She marinates the turkey. That's all I saw. Gosh, good. And this was what we were going to serve. And the president couldn't stay because he had to go to another one of those some places. They're moving around the helicopter, of course, he and his guards. And so Chota said, geez, it's turkey we're having. Oh, man, he said, I love that. I'll tell you what, you come on by the kitchen, I'll make you a bunch of sandwiches. So she fixed a bunch of sandwiches for these guys as they went off of their helicopter eating lunch on the way to the next stop. <laughs> I thought to myself, no, that, that's, that's the way it's to be done. That's the way it's to be done. Here, the president of the nation, a bunch of guys with, with machine guns hanging on their shoulder, waiting in line to get their turkey sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> what a, what a,
tremendous thing. But I think that that's pretty well the sense, you know. Actually, I had a couple of questions. Um, when did you start writing that newsletter kind of thing that you're... Pardon me, Eddie. When did you start writing that newsletter? Not like oh, when did I start writing it? Yeah. I've been writing it for years and years, but it's been intermittent. On and off, on and off. Now, as of September of this past year, we're pretty close to uh, having a monthly one. My April one, the April one will be coming out in the first week of May, but we left April on it because it looks better. And then <laughs> we're hoping to get one out before the end of May now, too. But if you don't have one, get to they get us your, your address. See to it that you get them. I'll let you know. Well, I have a couple things. Ishmu Kane had it right. Um, Ishmu Kane had it had it right. Um, la tortilla de la Maya. Yeah, yeah. Um, it it never leaves the blood. No, no, no. That's um, why you're so heavy into the chuchitos. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's not what I meant. But <laughs> um, and the the newsletters, I will be receiving them all from as, as far back as we can get them and I'll be making um, putting them all electronically as as much as I can getting them online oh, and uh, by title by date by content oh, um, so that they're searchable and people can look them up and I'll I'll get that well, get, lot, get that information out as, as uh, early as I can Appreciate that. Appreciate that very much. I just found that out tonight. Oh, thanks a lot. It's <laughs> arch, right? Maybe, maybe one more or two more questions, and it's getting late for me. I can get to bed, so I can get father going. I'm going good like this, Arch. I don't want to quit. All right. I have a question. Yeah. So, you know, you've written about Jesus and the Bible and interesting bringing down Minnesota groups, whether it's adults or whether it's the kids, is you know, the response right away is, well, we feel like we, we're not doing enough, or we need to work more, and they got this very rural work ethic, you know, they want to work harder, and um, and you always tell us that you're here to learn, that, that, that mm -hmm. the point of this place and the, mm -hmm. what you've created is educational, and so I wonder if you have any sort of a vision, I guess, for how you'd like to see that education piece continue. You know, we walk into that cafeteria and we see those four pillars of Catholic social teaching mm -hmm. up, up there, and 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 we have a, an idea of, of what that means. And when we sit and we listen to your stories, it falls into place easier. But I wonder if you have any sort of a, you know, I, I know the newsletters, I think, is, is part of that in, in the past, none of the stories, but I wonder what your thoughts are around how that education piece with the folks back home here is you know, I, that's a great question, Laurie. It would take a teacher to ask something like that. <laughs> but if, if this can possibly be, can we learn by osmosis? If we can, that would be the way to do it. Being able to be there and spending time with the people. And just being kind of laid back and relaxed, working with them, being alongside of them, uh, listening to them, hearing them, all of this. In April, I believe the the April newsletter, I wrote about uh, why we leave the door open to everybody. And the reason for that is precisely what you're talking about, to learn. Learn from the people. Love the people. And there was a group of young people from this parish that were down. And the catechist asked them to write their, their uh, impressions. There was a young gal named Michaela Andrews who wrote a poem. And boy, did that impress. Oof. And so we got permission to use that. And uh, I used that in the, in the newsletter. And she talked about, in that poem, she talked about coming back to the everyday. And uh, there was, she, she didn't learn anything? Well... Then she talked about seeing this little kid standing at the roadside, soccer ball, dirty shirt, the hat, and all this big smile. 
And she got a picture. And the picture was of his eyes. And she was wondering if she brought anything back with her to this point. She said, maybe I did. Maybe I brought his eyes back. Well, she, she ends up by saying, now tell me, friend, when you look into those eyes, can you believe anything that he, except that he is our brother? And I thought, there you got it, Kelly. <coughs> That's what it's about. And so the, the ongoing visits, the ongoing opportunities to, to be with the people, or people like them, or this, now we can, we can have a certain amount of, as it were, academic learning, different degrees. But a lot of it is just plain being with. And those opportunities to be with and how they affect us, I think are so important. And they're the ones that, uh, one of the ways you see that is there are people that are willing to take groups back to them, like some people like with the last name of Athelwitz. <laughs> <laughs> and the willingness to go down and, uh, uh, more than once. That indicates an understanding and appreciation of the people by osmosis, if I may put it that way. That is, that is important. Nothing very fancy. Nothing that you can, you know, as it were, write a book about. I know there's been a lot of books attempted, but do you really get at that? Then? Do you really get at it? I don't know. I'm sure there's more, more to eat, so <laughs> be sure to help yourself. Father, thank you so much.